Today we join the church worldwide in celebrating this season of Advent, of joyful expectation of the arrival of the Savior, the arrival of the Prince of Peace. This is indeed the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Opening our worship this morning by standing and singing number 83, Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. Welcome to each of you this morning as we begin worship today together. Especially if you are a first time visitor or a visitor with us today, we welcome you and we hope that you sense God's presence and peace in this place. If you would, if you're a visitor with us, please take one of the connect cards in the back of your pew racks right there and fill that out for us and drop it into the offering plate so that we can know a little more about you and connect with you in an authentic and loving way. Indeed, this is an important day because it is the first day of a new church year. It's the first Sunday of Advent. And while we are watching and waiting and anticipating the arrival of the Christ child, you may notice that we have a stable here at the front but there's only one little sheep and one cow there. And throughout all the Sundays of Advent, we will light a candle each Sunday and our characters, the biblical characters of the Christmas story will travel closer and closer to the manger each week. So as you come in each Sunday, be looking for them as they are part of our worship experience together. Next Sunday is a very important Sunday in the life of our church. It is going to be a special day for inviting friends, neighbors, co-workers, your dentist, your doctor, whoever you know, we want you to invite them, not only to our morning service, but our evening service as well. We're going to be having this inviting emphasis in morning worship, we'll have special um, music that day from the choir and the orchestra with our Christmas cantata, followed by a reception after worship where you can bring your guest. It's going to be a beautiful service, and we hope that you will invite many people to join us that day. And in the evening service, we are at all together inviting college students to come and join that evening. Josh has asked for some special help with this, 
You can help provide food, or you can write a little note of encouragement. You can remember what it was like to take exams. None of us want to do that again. It was tough, right? But a note of encouragement will go a long way to helping someone smile during this stressful time. So one of those notes, if you want to get one today, you can pick one up at the Welcome Center, write a note of encouragement to a college student and remind them that God is with them during this season. So as we continue in worship together, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this first Sunday of Advent as we wait in hope we say, come, thou long-expected Jesus. Lord, we realize that we're a people who wait between your first coming and your second coming. We're watching and waiting, not only for the Christ child, who we remember in this season, but for you to return again. Lord, fix our eyes on you during this time of worship. Help us to put aside anything that is distracting us or hindering us from worshiping you with our whole hearts today. Lord, we pray also for those who are joining us through live stream or for those who are watching on television. We pray, Lord, that they would feel part of the worship of the people of God gathered in this place today. Lord, may all that is said here bring honor and glory to your name today. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Remaining seated, let's continue our worship by singing 81, number 81, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence.
As we continue in worship at this moment, would you join me for a reading of Psalm 122 that is lovingly printed in your vibrant bulletin. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper in loving. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We're happy this morning to welcome the Lamb family as they assist in our worship this morning by the lighting of our first Advent candle of the season. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them hath the light shined. We walk among so much darkness. We've seen the light. Let's look now upon this candle as it's lit and as it reminds us of that light. We light this candle in hope. Hear God's promise of hope from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Let us pray. Faithful God, out of war's chaos, you bring the order of peace. Renew us in hope that we may work toward Christ's advent of peace among all nations. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen. Remaining seated, join me in singing hymn 80. Good morning, church family. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this past week of Thanksgiving. Please help to remind us how much we have been given and just how grateful we should be. Thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As we enter into the Christmas season, please help us to keep our focus on your Son, Jesus, his works, and his teachings. Please accept these offerings today and use it to further your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.
Let us pray. God with us, we are overjoyed, thankful, and reminded of how you came to earth just to save us. Gracious God, as we begin this Advent season, may we never forget that you came to be with us. May we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for those even in this season that find it quite challenging to find you in the midst of grief, despair, and the loss of many loved ones. We ask God, the God who is with us, to be with all of us. Comfort us in the midst of possible grief. Comfort us in the midst of despair. We pray, God, that we may also be reminded that you are the reason for this season and that we would center our focus on that and not simply the busyness of this season. We pray even now, God, that we may be sensitive to the move of God and that as you move, that we may move. And so, God, as we are gathered here to worship you, may you free us from distraction. May you free us from anything else that could be plaguing our mind. And may our focus and our hope be on you. Thank you so much for the hope and the peace that you coming to earth offers us. May we accept it every day. May we live it out every single way. And may we truly always be centered and reminded that you are God with us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As you join in singing the next hymn, if the words seem slightly familiar to you, it's probably because you read them this morning. If you read our Advent devotional booklet, Let Heaven and Nature Sing. And this morning's devotional article was written by our very own Heather Webb. And she highlights this particular hymn we're about to sing. Now the heavens start to whisper, stand and join me as we sing 86. Now the heavens start to whisper.
Our scripture for this first Advent sermon comes from Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken, one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. It is 23 days, 12 hours, and 30 minutes until Christmas Day. Your shopping and wrapping and baking all has to be done. The countdown just started. But we know for sure when Jesus is coming, Christmas is less than 24 days away on your calendar. And so if it sneaks up on you, that's on you. The morning's reading is a familiar reading for the first Sunday of Advent. But it deals with a slightly different question. Not asking when does Jesus come. When is Jesus coming back? When, Matthew got, when Matthew's gospel was written, the promise of Jesus' return was so delayed that a lot of people had just given up. You remember, in anticipation of his crucifixion, Jesus told his followers that he was coming again. And so many people quit their job. They thought he's coming like sometime next week. Didn't buy a large jar of mayonnaise. I mean, he's He's coming. Then a decade passed, another decade passed. Matthew's writing to a group that's been tired of waiting, and he writes within that tension. He says, Jesus is coming right back, but God only knows when. To be sure, a lot of people today have given up on the return of Jesus, believing it was some kind of first century misunderstanding dismiss it all as though it's just backdrops for books like the late great planet earth or the left behind series just some first century misunderstanding but others are completely consumed with the return of jesus well like the people who wrote those books right Algorithms and biblical dates and prophecies trying to calculate the return of Jesus. Clear convictions about who makes up the 144,000 of God's elect. Premillennial or postmillennial clarity about the final days. And preachers on the AM radio who have declared a sure understanding of scriptural discernment. And they know that Jesus is coming back just after lunch on July 22nd because the beast in Revelation is clearly China and haven't you been reading the papers? Well, the writer of Matthew doesn't fall into either of those two camps. Instead, he, he stands firmly on the literal promise of Christ's return, but he doesn't have out the charts and the calculators. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Rather than spending energy trying to calculate what Jesus and the angels don't even know, how about living in this present instead? Be ready now. And I love the irony of this. The way to be more fully in the present is to back off and see the long arc of what God is doing across history. 
Today's scripture is the 3,000 foot view of God's redemptive history. It gets us beyond our, our calendar and our Christmas list and our Amazon Prime. We start Advent by viewing God's big universal work, God's grand purpose, reclaiming the world through love. And we start Advent with the reminder that Christmas Day represents the end of an old temple era, the beginning of a new order. We begin Advent talking about the second coming of Jesus because it's a reminder that God is not finished. Jesus will come again to reclaim this broken world. But the kingdom of God is at hand too. God is right now, three days beyond Thanksgiving, at work among us, repairing the world through love. Hopefully, we can get in on it. If we do, we find our purpose. But sadly, within the expansive work of God's love, there are some people who operate as though there is nothing bigger going on in the universe than trying to locate the official baby shark Plato set. People living small lives because their story isn't caught up in a bigger story. No day has sharp meaning because living is separated from purpose. That's what Jesus said, only he used different images. He told the crowd gathered that when God acted big in human history before, there were people just occupied with temporary things, things that don't endure. Remember, Jesus reminds them, Noah was building an ark. <laughs> Noah was anticipating, prepared for God's mighty work in the world. Others were eating and drinking and going to weddings. The flood came and they weren't ready at all. Jesus says, be alert. Be alert, be aware of what God is doing and participate. Be present, be alive. I will come again, says Jesus. And some of you will be living with alert anticipation and others of you will just be planning next Tuesday's dinner and you've got nothing more substantial than that to live for. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. Two guys will be out working in the field. One of them is going to be working with promise and purpose and anticipation. He's going to know that he's a part of God's plan and storyline. <laughs> the other guy will just be clueless about the ways of God. He'll just be gathering wheat. How sad. He's living for nothing bigger than wheat. <laughs> Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal. One of those women is going to believe that she is a part of God's activity in the world. She's going to be shaped by the values and purposes of the gospel. She will love and give and understand her life as part of the narrative of God's work to reclaim a broken world. And the other woman will have nothing bigger to live for than the satisfaction of well-ground meal. What a way to live. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. So don't wait to your deathbed to ask ultimate questions. Ask them now. Live ready. Don't live in fear or dread either. This, this isn't about fiery billboards that threaten the second coming. Alert and ready is actually the best way to live. If we, li if we read these passages through the lens of fear, it doesn't le lead to life abundant. But gratitude that we play a role in God's kingdom keeps us alert to ways to be included in the kingdom of God. God's love project reclaiming the world. 
spring of my 10th grade year was my last year to play organized baseball after playing for most of my life. I rode, mostly rode the bench that spring because I was playing second string, second base behind Mickey Boyer. Some of you longtime Atlantans will remember his dad, Cleet Boyer, played for the Braves. Y'all remember? Played for the Braves and several other major league teams. Well, if you saw Cleet Boyer play, then you might have guessed that his son Mickey was a better athlete than I was. And at some point, I had to come face to face with the limits of my 110 pound athleticism and give it up. But I'd played baseball since I was about six. And well, when I was just starting, about six, I would be out there with my glove hoping they did not hit the ball to me. If it did come in my direction, I would run toward it, wait till it stopped, pick it up, and then wait for somebody from the dugout or the stands to yell at me where to throw it, and then I would throw it in the way they told me to. But season after season, I learned more about how to play. Eventually, I could catch the ball before it stopped rolling. And I knew where to throw it without listening for my dad's voice in the bleachers. So by the time I was playing high school ball, I actually wanted the ball hit to me because I was ready. I'd been coached to be ready, and ready made me feel most alive. Before every pitch, I had a routine to prepare myself. I'd rehearse all the options about what would happen if the ball came to me. And then when the ball was about to be pitched, I would get in a wide, balanced, relaxed, athletic stance that my coaches called the ready position, right? And in my head, before the pitcher started the wind up, I would start the rehearsal. Runner on first, nobody out. If it's a pop-up I can get to, I call the others out, off, I catch the ball, check the runner back to first. If it's a sharply hit ground ball, then I need to get the lead runner at second. But if it's a dribbler or takes me too far to my left, I need to make sure to get the sure out at first. The pitcher goes into his windup. I get relaxed, balanced, ready position. Strike two, I go through it all again, right? And most of the time, the play was not mine to make. But I had to be ready, and it created an eagerness so that eventually I wanted the ball hit to me. I wanted to be able to make a play I knew I was capable of making. And so being ready didn't lead to anxiety. Being ready led to freedom, being fully alive. I had a role to play on this team. And Jesus knows that living ready means living into the fullness of each day. In all occasions, being in the ready position because it's the best way to live. The ball might get hit to us. We might have an opportunity to play a role in God's project to reclaim the world. Be ready all of the time. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So always be ready. And being ready doesn't just mean being alert. It means being prepared. If you knew a thief was coming to your house like tomorrow at midnight, you might prepare You might take the jewelry over to your sister's house. You might put the Louisville slugger by the bed. You might turn all the lights on. Stay awake, be prepared. And if you know that Jesus is coming, you might be prepared too. But that kind of preparation is a different kind of inventory of the valuables. Do I value things that endure? Is my inner life as healthy as my stock portfolio? Do I read more scripture and devotional literature than magazines? 
Do I know more about the life of the Apostle Paul or Matt Ryan or Kim Kardashian? Am I doing all that I can to live prepared and ready? And do I have a rich enough prayer life to know when I'm being called to step up into the narrative of God? Or am I just living whip, wound, bang, ATM, let's go to Lenox first, then we'll go to Phipps. I'll pay the $7 more for express shipping. Or does our life of devotion lead us to be prepared? I mentioned this image before, but I love this image, so I might mention it today and then again sometime in the future. You might get it more than once. Barbara Brown Taylor referred to herself once as a detective of divinity. I just love that. Always looking for clues that God is at work in the world. Well, it takes preparation to be a detective. It means living in the ready position because you don't want to miss what God is up to and you want to be able to get your own life in the stream of God's purpose and take that ride because you might find your purpose there too. So we start the season of Advent with the lens wide and our waiting begins We wait on the birth of Jesus to happen in our lives again this year. But today's story instructs us on how to wait for the next coming of Jesus too. And we're told to live ready. Don't miss a thing. Be fully present, fully alive, fully awake. But this urging comes when we really don't have time. What a time to read this scripture about being ready, prayerful, and attentive. I mean, if if, if this scripture were read the first Sunday of February, we'd have time to sit in the windowsill and drink cocoa and reflect on God and meaning and purpose, the long arc of God's love. But right now we've got too much going on. Go back to the store. I'm out of tape. What do I need to cook before we go to your mother's? We need to find something for Carol this year. I've got to buy something for Carol this year. She bought something for me last year. I didn't have anything. I was so embarrassed. Stop at Kroger on the way home. I need two cans of cream of mushroom soup. We don't have time to be a detective, to look for clues of God's work. We don't have time to live alert. We don't have time to stop and bless other people with our lives. But Jesus says, therefore you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So be alert, ready position, the ball might come to you, you want to be ready to play if God's calling you into God's magic purpose. Let's stand and sing and respond.
Would you be seated for just a moment because I have good news to share and I want you all in on it. This is Sally Angevine and Sally had a season where she grew up in this church and she's coming home. Sally's been away, her membership's been at another Baptist church, but at this stage of life, retired elementary school teacher, she is saying, I want to come back home to Second Ponce and throw my life uh, into the life of this church. And if you're as excited about her return home as I am, say amen. amen. Overwhelming and welcome. And following the benediction, make that more personal, would you? Come by and tell her in person how glad you are to have her home. It's been another good day. Let's stand for the benediction. Go now, fully aware of God's presence and work in the world, and throw your life into that stream. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us again today. You honor us by allowing our broadcast into your life. As you can see behind me, I'm in our beautiful but now empty sanctuary. But on Sunday mornings when this room is alive, this is my favorite place and my favorite hour of the week. We sing and pray and hear scripture together. And we become formed into community by God's presence with us. I know that some of you are not physically able to join us on Sundays, and I'm delighted that this broadcast lets us come to you. But if you are able to be with us, 11 o'clock on Sunday may end up becoming your favorite hour of the week too. Home or here, I hope you will worship with us again soon.